all set. Okay, wonderful. So Hanukkah is a very fun, you know, holiday. And it's very interesting because the holiday of Hanukkah, it's, we light the menorah, so we're, we're commemorating. There's basically two miracles that happen on Hanukkah. The first miracle is that the Jewish people won the war. The Greeks were fighting against them. And they were a very small group of people, the Jewish people. And the Greeks were a very large group. And not only were the Jews a small group of people, but the Jewish people were a very weak group. They were more academic. They were the type that was sitting and learning Torah and studying. They were not about you know, fighting, and they didn't know the first thing about war and fighting. So it ended up that it was a, weak, a group of weak, small Jews against a big, strong group of Greeks, and they won. The Jewish people won. So that was a tremendous miracle. Now, what was going on during that time that they felt it necessary to fight with the Greeks. What was going on? So the Greeks were very upset that the Jews were studying Torah. They said, we don't mind if you study Torah as an intellectual pursuit. We don't mind if you study it just to be smart and academic. As academia, that's wonderful. But if you're doing it as something godly to connect to Hashem, no, we don't, we don't want that. And so that's what they told them, they said, you know, we don't allow you to study Torah and to be religious. They didn't allow them to keep Shabbos. They did not allow them to have a bris. They did not allow them to keep kosher. They didn't want them doing any of the mitzvot. They didn't want any of, and they didn't even want learning Torah in the way that the Jewish people were learning the Torah. So what they did was Jewish people had to sneak. So that's where the dreidel comes in. And the Jewish people would be learning Torah. And as soon as they would hear the Greeks coming, they would tell the children who they were teaching, take out a, uh, a spin top, a dreidel, and let's just pretend like we're playing. And that's what they do. Every time they heard the Greeks coming, they would learn in caves, they would hide. But if they heard the Greeks, the Greeks would come. And they would just see that they were playing games, spin top, dreidel. And so that's why we play dreidel nowadays. So this is the life that they were living. And it was another story to show you how, um, how much the Greeks wanted to just defile everything that the Jews did. It says that before every Jewish girl was to get married, they did not want her getting married holy. They did not want her getting married as a virgin. So they said that she had to spend the night before her wedding with the general Greek. And because they wanted her to come in impure to the marriage. Because Jewish marriage is all about bringing purity into the marriage. And they didn't want that. So there's a very famous story of Yehudis. And it says by every story... There's usually a good Jewish woman behind the miracle story. And so Esther in the story of Purim. And now we see Yehudis in the story, Judith in the story of Hanukkah. So a lot of the Jewish people, because of this decree, they would just try to keep their wedding very quiet, undercover, so they can get married without the general knowing that they were getting married. But Yehudis was the daughter of a public figure and therefore people knew she was getting married and she couldn't just keep a low profile. So she had a plan. And this was while the war was going on and the Jewish people were fighting, but it was really hard. It was like we said, they were so small, they were so weak. The Greeks were so much stronger and so much bigger than them. And how are they to win this war? So what happened? So what happened was, is that she decided she's going to, she tells the general, she says, no worries. 
You don't have to come chase me. I am coming to you willingly. I'm getting married and I'm coming to you willingly. And I'm so excited. I'm so happy. We're going to have such a great time. And she brings with her very delicious cheese that she made. And cheese is very salty. And she brings with her a lot of wine, very, very strong wine. And she says, yes, I'm so excited. Look, I prepared snacks and cheese and wine for us. And so that's what happened. She takes the cheese. She takes the wine. And she gives the general some cheese. And what happens after he has some cheese? He is now very thirsty. So she says, oh, no worries that you're thirsty. I have delicious, delicious wine. And she gives us wine. He says, oh, it's delicious. Oh, let me give you a little bit more. And then she says, okay, a little more cheese. And then, of course, he's thirsty again, so he has a little bit more wine. And before you know it, he is a little drunk. And then she gives him a little more until he is out cold. He is so drunk. And he didn't touch her. He didn't do anything to her. Of course, this was tremendous, tremendous self-sacrifice because she had no idea if her plan would work. What if he would have decided to attack her and get physical with her before she you know, gave him, before she got him drunk? So now he's drunk and she has in her bag, she had hidden a sword. She took out the sword and she cut off his neck, which I'm sure took a lot of courage and I'm sure it was not something a Jewish girl, you know, felt comfortable doing or even, you know, knew how to do, but that's what she did. And she took the bag and she, you know, wrapped it up and put it in her bag. I'm sorry, took his head. And, you know, later she goes out and she says to the guards out there, oh, he's really tired. We had a great night and, you know, he's really tired. So, you know, let him sleep, let him sleep. And meanwhile, she goes to the battlefield and she takes the head and she gives it to the Jewish soldiers. And... They show it to the Greeks and the Greeks see their mighty general is dead. And that was really the start of how they won the war. This really led to them winning the war. But we see from all these things that they didn't want them studying Torah. They didn't want them coming into marriage pure. They also, we see from this how much they just wanted to defile the Jewish people and make everything unholy. So the Holy Temple was the same thing. They took the Holy Temple and they put idols and they put pigs. So they put everything that was the exact opposite of what a Holy Temple is about. The Holy Temple, the base on Middash, is all about revealing Hashem. It's all about holiness. And this was doing the exact opposite. So what did they do? We said they put in idols and they put in non-kosher animals, anything to make it unholy. And they destroyed so much of the base of Mikdash. So after they won the war, the Jewish people rededicated the Holy Temple. And now they're so excited. They clean out the base of Mikdash. They take out all the idols and they're getting together all the different, you know, the altar and everything in the Holy Temple. And they have the menorah. They used to light the menorah every day in the Holy Temple. They're so excited and they want to light the menorah. Now, like I said, they want to make everything impure. They want to make everything unholy. They want to make everything. So they made sure to take all the jugs of oil that they would use to light the menorah. And they made sure to tamper with all of them. So they opened it up. So like, you know, when you have a sealed jug, like let's say you go to their grocery store, and you want to buy uh, a prescription. Or, you know, you want to buy, um, you know, whatever it is. A jar of peanut butter. A bottle of orange juice. 
if you see that it's already been opened and it's not sealed, you're not really going to want to eat it. You're not going to want to drink it because you feel like it's been tampered with. It's not pure. I don't really want this. So they did not want it because now the oil is contaminated by the Greeks and it's not holy anymore. They were supposed to use holy sealed oil. So what happened was, is they decided that they're not going to take, they're not going to just give up. And even though the Greeks made sure to go to every jug and, you know, when something is, it was, they wreaked havoc in the base of Mikdash. So everything was thrown over, vandalized, and they searched and searched and they could not find a jug of oil. They said, we're not giving up. And they searched more and more until they finally found one jug of oil, one jug. And when they found this one jug of oil, they decided, this is wonderful. We can now light the menorah today, but we have a little bit of a problem. It takes eight days to go make new oil because they had to travel there, make the oil and travel back. And that was a process of eight days. So they said, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? We don't have enough oil. So they said, listen, in the meantime, let's light this. And, you know, what we could do today, we'll do today. And tomorrow, you know, we'll have to figure that out. In the meanwhile, send someone to go get, you know, to start the process of making new oil. And they take this one little teeny jug of oil and they light the menorah, which had, it was a candelabra of seven, and we'll discuss that soon. That was seven and this is eight. And he said that, so uh, sorry, the, the Jewish people, they decided they're lighting the menorah and they light it. And instead of lasting just for that day, it lasted for eight days instead of one. So a whole extra seven days and nights the menorah lasted. And that's why we light the menorah nowadays. So the mitzvah actually is only to light one candle. Um, the fact that we add and we add every night a light is a way that we beautify the mitzvah, but it's not, it's going beyond the letter of the law. It's doing more than we have to. And then we have the idea of, you know, we have a few people in the house lighting the menorah. That's another way of beautifying it. And most mitzvahs you could beautify, but we don't have this idea of beautifying it so, like, in so many ways as we do with, the, with this menorah. And it's the common practice, actually, of everybody, even secular Jews, to do it, like, in the most beautiful way that we don't just say oh let's do the bare minimum i could just light one candle that's good enough oh we'll have one menorah per household we have one menorah in most places per person and we add in the light which has tremendous lesson of you know we're always trying to add and grow when we bring light if we accomplish one light today tomorrow we've got to do more we got to do two lights you did two now you got to move on to three we're always we say in hebrew ma'alin bekodesh we're always rising higher in holiness. So it says that the Jews do this because the way that the Jews behaved in the time of the Holy Temple was they didn't just say, we could do the bare minimum, we could do the mitzvah, or even we could beautify it. They said, no, we are going to search until we find a jug of pure oil. Really, according to Allah, they were supposed to, according to Jewish law, they were supposed to use pure oil but if you're in a situation that there's no pure oil and the whole congregation is there, then for that time, you're allowed to use impure oil. But they said, no, we, we know we don't need this physically. We know we don't need this spiritually, but we want to do it to express our love for God. So I, they act in a way of giving themselves completely over, not just doing something for the sake of, I need it physically to live, not for the sake I need it spiritually to do the mitzvah, 
But even beyond that, I don't need it physically. Physically, I'm healthy. I could be fine without lighting the menorah. I don't need it spiritually because really I'm allowed to use impure oil. But they wanted to do it in the utmost beautiful way, not just beautifying it, but beautification of beautification. Like just to express their love, Tasha. And because they totally put themselves aside, like meaning it's not something I need physically, it's not something I need spiritually beyond both of that. God made this tremendous miracle. So it says when we commemorate this miracle, we like to do it in a double beautified way where we don't just light the menorah, we make sure to add a light every night and we make sure that all the people in the household, I mean, of course, if you're stuck, you know, one person could light for everybody, but it's the common custom that many people light. And it says, why is it like this? Most mitzvahs that we do, the majority of Jews, especially secular Jews, do not do the mitzvah in the most beautified way. They do like, kind of like, you know, the minimum, okay? They don't just do it in, in such a way. So the explanation is that because the Jews did this from the depths of their heart, not for physical, not for spiritual, coming from the deepest part, we call it the pintila yid, the little dot of, Jew, of a Jew that's in there. And even if a Jew doesn't keep Torah, he doesn't keep Shabbos, he doesn't keep kosher, he doesn't know what Torah is, he's so disconnected. Even such a Jew has a very deep connection. And when you press that button and you say like, do you want to live or die a Jew? Even if he's not keeping anything, but he still has the Jewish identity, he's still connected. Like there's the famous story of a little boy whose name was Yasele. And he grew up religious, and then he decided he didn't want to be religious anymore. And he became, not only was he not keeping Shabbos or kosher, but he wasn't keeping moral things. He became a thief, he became part of a gang. And he really was like, you know, very disconnected from Judaism and very disconnected from being a good moral person. And one time he was stealing from the church with his gang. And his job was to be inside the church, get the stuff thrown out the window, and then they would take it and run. So this way, if he's seen going out of the church, he has nothing, you know, nothing in his hand. And he got caught. And of course, the second the you know, they see the priest coming in, everyone else runs away and he's the only one stuck there. And the priest says, how dare you? The audacity that you have. You are stealing. Now, not only are you stealing, you're stealing from the church. You deserve to be killed. And then he says to him, but I have one way out. There's one way that I will not kill you. And that is if you convert to Christianity. You know, you're Jewish, you convert to Christianity. And he says, I was born a Jew. I will die a Jew. Now, where did this come from? He didn't care about God anymore. He wasn't keeping anything. You know, not the most basic commandments of don't steal. But when it pressed on that button, do you want to be Jewish? But it came so far to his love for Hashem. It hit that chord inside of him. And he said, no, deep down, I am so connected to God. I will never die a Jew. I will never die in Jew. Even if I'm stealing, even if I'm not doing all these things, I am still a Jew. This level, every single Jew has. So usually they're not put in this situation where they're being pressed, right? Like the whole time that no one was saying to him, you know, convert or I'll kill you. Then he wasn't thinking about that. And he was just you know, not going about his a Jewish life. But the second that it came to convert, don't be a Jew anymore, that was, that was tapping on the deepest part of his soul. And that's why it was awakened. So the Jews use this deepest part of their soul where they just loved Hashem so dearly. It wasn't just about fulfilling your command. It was about doing it in the most beautiful way even if I don't need it physically, even if I don't need it spiritually, my love is just that deep. 
And this level that we call Mesiris Nefesh, which is sacrificing yourself, your life to serve God, this level is connected to every Jew. And that's why every Jew, even secular Jews, do this mitzvah in such a beautified, high-level way. Even though the other mitzvahs, like, you know, other holidays, people are not doing it in, you know, going so beyond the letter of the law for it. But here they are. So that's the second miracle. The second miracle, in addition to winning the war that we stated before, is finding this jug of oil. And the way that we commemorate it is lighting the menorah, as we said. And this second commemoration has this unique quality of Jews everywhere trying to do it in this most beautified way beyond the letter of the law, because every Jew is connected to self-sacrifice when it comes down to it. Now, let's talk a little bit about the difference between the menorah of Hanukkah and the menorah that we have nowadays. So the menorah that was in the Holy Temple was lit inside the Holy Temple and it was lit during the day. The menorah of Hanukkah, we light either by a window or a doorway, which is symbolic of the outside. And we light it at night when it is dark. So we have opposites here, inside, outside, dark, light. So again, Mesa Megdash is inside light. Hanukkah is outside darkness. So what's the difference? The Beis HaMikdash menorah, the menorah of the Holy Temple, was lit inside where it was not only, not only do they do it during the day, which is when it's light, they did it in the inside in a place that was very holy. Now, why did they do it in a place that was very holy? Because that was the function of the menorah at the time of the Holy Temple. The function of the menorah in the time of the Holy Temple was to bring more light in an already revealed place. They lit it in the Holy Temple, which was a very holy place where it was light. So they were just adding light to previous light. But the menorah of today, of Hanukkah, that we light every year, we do it at night when it's dark to symbolize this is where there's darkness, where God is not revealed, where there's impurity, where we don't feel Hashem. And we light it outside to show we're dealing with the outside world that is so immoral, that is so self-centered, that is so hiding God, where God is so not revealed. And that's what the Hanukkah menorah is about. It's about lighting up the exile, lighting up the darkness and transforming it into light. So that's why in the Holy Temple, because it was lighting up a place of light, they only did it when the base Midrash was holy. When the Greeks had the Holy Temple, they couldn't do it because it needed to be lit in a place of holiness, in a place of good, in a place of light, in a place of godliness. The menorah of Hanukkah, on the other hand, that we said is symbolic of lighting up the dark, that's why we have it forever. Even we don't have a holy temple. Because lighting up the dark is, we don't need to be in a holy place to do that. We actually need darkness to light it up. So we light up at night, symbolic of that. And it says that the, the, the whole idea of when are you allowed to light the menorah, you have to light it specifically at dark. You have to wait until the sun is going down. The sun is going away to show that the light is away and darkness is coming in, which darkness means it hides something. When it's dark, you can't see what's in the room. So the darkness was concealing Hashem. And this is what the job, this is the theme of Hanukkah. The theme of Hanukkah is taking unholy things, taking things that hide Hashem and reveal Hashem in them. And so we compare the menorah of the Holy Temple to a tzaddik, to a very righteous person. 
The righteous person never sinned. His whole life, he was just good. And this righteous person only has, he has no relation to bad. And he only, his level of godliness is much stronger. I'm compare the Hanukkah menorah to the Baal Teshuva, to the repenter. Because what does a repenter do? He has bad ways, but then he takes those bad ways and he turns it into light. He brings light and he transforms it into godliness. Because what does teshuva mean? In teshuva is repentance. But in Hebrew, if you take the word teshuva, it means tashuv, return, Hashem to God. You're returning. When you return, it means I was there once. And I'm just going back to my old place. So that's what he says. What is he saying? I am going back to my original self. I am going back to where my soul always really wanted to be. Because my soul always wants to be connected to God. So that's the idea. And it says Hanukkah is greater because it's so much greater to take something dark and turn it into light and just bring more light into a place of light. For example, let's say you have two students and one student is, you know, an A student, A minus student. She's, you know, very smart and she behaves and she's a good kid. And her whole life, she was always getting A's basically. And now you got her to an A plus. And the second student was an F student. They could not sit still. They could not learn. It was so difficult. They really just weren't doing it. And then you take this student and you make that student into an A plus student. Which one? is a bigger accomplishment. Which one do you think is a bigger accomplishment? The F student turning into an A or the A minus student turning into an A plus? Exactly. So the idea is that when you take the F student who could not do it and you're able to bring out in them that they really have the potential. You're able to transform that darkness into light. That is a bigger accomplishment than just taking the good and making it a little better. And that's the lesson of Hanukkah. The lesson of Hanukkah is to just take a little bit of light. And if you just put a little bit of light, it dispels a lot of darkness. And it takes away a lot of darkness. Mm -hmm. So that's the way Jews are taught. When we encounter something negative, instead of saying, oh, it's negative, let me fight back with negativity. How do we respond? We respond with, let me add a little light. Let me just do a good deed. Let me just change over something to the positive. You know, my little bit of positive is going to take away the negativity. My little positive, my light, is going to take away the darkness without me fighting, without me doing anything. And that's what the Baal Teshuva, that's what the repenter does. He just returns sure. back to God. Yes. What went through my mind is, why do we consider it a minor holiday when you have targeted the meeting of Jewishness within the last 15 minutes? Yes. Why so are we diminishing the it is not it is not a diminished holiday. No, this, it should not be. No. Why do you feel like it's diminished? Because everybody says it's a minor holiday. We don't really get into it and stuff like that. This is what I've heard for decades from, from really. Everyone. Yes. That's so interesting. Because oh, I it's thought not like considered. all Jews, even secular Jews, are so connected to this holiday. Because it seems to me that people say, oh, wow, oh, I'll, I'll do it. But, you know, it's the gift thing. It's the eight nights. It's this, you know, the kids are having a great old time with the dreidel. But it's not, you're, you're, you're teaching what you just said 
I would love you to upload it because I want to share it with so many people. What you just said is what we are all about. Taking right. that darkness, taking that student. So, that, exactly. That and that's class. what I started, you know, right. towards the middle beginning of the class. That's what I was explaining right. that it is so connected to every Jew. Everything. Lot, Everything. A lot of Jews do not keep like, you know, they're not so into Passover. They're not so into Purim. But almost every Jew is connected to Hanukkah because this is the essence of who we are. Well, this Passover, is it's the story. So, of course, we're connected. But this, what you just said, the stories and the examples should make us connected to realize that this is important. That yes, don't this use is, the word minor. I don't know why people use, you don't, but everybody. Yeah, else oh, that's so interesting. Yes, yeah, so you got to spread. Well, that's what we're saying. Let's There's spread. darkness. Darkness is confusion. Darkness is when the truth is right. not there. When God yeah. is hidden. So this is your mission now to take a little bit of light oh my gosh, and share sure. it with these people. It says, if you know Aleph and Bays, right? A and B. Yes. And your friend only knows A, it's your obligation to teach them B. It's great. Teach them I mean, the whole concept should be celebrated, you know? Absolutely. You should put this, this upload like out to all the students, not just the young, you know, the little ones, but the right. parents, the families. I mean, that's the essence of who we are. Yes, and this is the said, essence okay, of well, who we yeah. are. And this is who we are. We are that repenter. We're yes. always trying to return back to our real self. Yes. And that's what we say. We just return back to God. And we don't look at all the darkness as, ooh, that's terrible. We look at the darkness as an opportunity to rejuvenate. A positive. positive. As something, this is going to make me a stronger person. This is going to make me serve God better. And you know what it actually says? It says that the repenter, his sins turn into mitzvahs. His sins become good deeds. And when I used to hear this, I used to think that doesn't really make so much sense because if we want to say, fine, we're really proud. He changed his ways. He now is no longer, whatever it is, stealing, eating not kosher, whatever it may be, you know, talking badly about people, judging people. So then once he changes it, we should erase it. Why should it become good? Erase it would be like amazing because usually you can't erase the past. You know, you could try to cover it up a little bit, but to erase it, well, why would it become good? But the reason is because it's mitzvah. We said it turns into a mitzvah. Mitzvah is not only commandment, but it also means connect. And a mitzvah is when we connect with Hashem. A mitzvah is when we connect with God. And when we connect with God, what do we do? We strengthen our relationship with him. And he says that that sin many times, when does a person repent? Usually they fall down and they sin. And then that sin wakes them up. And then they become even better. When you get that wake up call, you don't go back to your old way. You go to an even greater level. For example, let's say something breaks in the house. And so then you got to fix it. Now, usually you don't just fix it exactly the way it was. Usually then you're like, oh, you know what? I'll make it a little bit nicer now. And so because of the breaking, you made now something nicer. Or let's reply to mitzvah. So let's say there's a person who keeps kosher, but they eat in non-kosher restaurant. And they say, okay, I just take like, you know, the fish and the salad. I'm not going to eat any, you know, meat or anything like that. But I'm just going to take like be vegetarian, you know? I'll take potatoes and salad. And then, you know, they're used to doing that. And one time they come to there. And instead, what do they do? They start eating the meat. Because, you know, you, you're there. And before he knew it. So then what happens? After that, the person realizes that he stooped so low. And he's so upset that he, you know, had the meat. So what does he do? He makes a resolution right then and there. I'm not eating anything in the non-kosher restaurant. 
not the potato, not the salad, not the fish. I don't care. So his mistake brings him to a higher level. He brings him to a stronger connection. So mitzvah means connect. And in certain cases, the sin makes you connect on a deeper level. So the sin actually brings you to a higher place. So that's what we say when there's darkness, we don't get scared. We say, this is our service. This is what God loves. Hashem appreciates it so much because it took so much more effort to change the dark to the light. And it was so much more. And that's what we're all about. We take a little bit of light. We say a good, kind word to somebody. And it could change their whole day. They come in. They're in a bad mood. They're not happy. What do you have to do? You just say, good morning. And then they're like, you know, how are you? And you start talking to them. And they feel like, you know what? I was noticed. This person cares about me. Oh, and it could change their whole day. Are you saying, you know what, Shabbos, I want to make it special. I'm going to eat something special. I'm going to light the Shabbos candles. This Shabbos, I'm going to make sure that I don't use my phone for a whole Shabbos, whatever it may be. But when you do that, you are changing the entire world because the world has a certain amount of darkness and a certain amount of light. And once you add more light, you took darkness away added light and the ratio in the world of dark and evil is different and this also connects to why Hanukkah has seven candles sorry has eight candles while the candelabra in the holy temple only had seven why do we switch from seven to eight well what does seven symbolize seven is symbolic of nature because there are seven days of the week so that's the natural order of the world eight is above nature if seven is nature eight is more than seven so it's symbolic of being above nature and it says that in order to add more light you only need like something natural it's just nature i'm adding light to a light thing I'm doing good in a good place. That's just, I need a regular natural light. That's all I need. But if I want to light up the dark and I want to take something that is the antithesis of God, the antithesis of morality, the antithesis of holy, then I need a supernatural night, a supernatural light to combat that darkness, to make it into light. So seven wouldn't be strong enough. I need eight. I need something beyond nature to come in and light up this darkness. And Hanukkah gives us that power of the supernatural. And it gives us that power to light up the darkness of the Holy Temple because we have the number eight, which means we have a supernatural power. And that is the idea of Hanukkah, to take that supernatural power within us that innate love that we spoke about more towards the beginning of we love Hashem. We only want things holy. Even if we don't need it, we still want to serve God in the deepest way from the core of our hearts, from the core of our souls. And we want to connect to Hashem in that way. And we have that power from the deepest part of our soul. We have the power of aid of supernatural to light up the dark. And we just do it step by step. We just do a little bit. I add one candle on the first day, just put a little bit of light. Once I lit up a little bit, and now I brought a little positivity, or I celebrated Shabbos a little bit, then I could go the next day and I could do two. I could add, and I just felt a little more darkness. And I'm used to one already, so it's not a big deal, right? If I would do one on the first night and one on the second night, I'm like, hey, I'm just doing the same thing. What's the point? I want to add. It's more exciting now because I got used to that level already. Now I'm going to keep Shabbos a little more. Now I spoke to them. I said, good morning. Now I'm going to actually engage in a conversation with them. I'm going to really, you know, bring a positive, more positivity to, towards our day. Or, you know, I, I said good morning to one person. The next day I'm going to say good morning to two people. So we're constantly adding in this idea. So Hanukkah is all about bringing peace. Peace is when you have two opposites. 
So we are bringing peace between the light and the dark. But how do we bring peace? Not by fighting, but just by infusing light. So we're bringing peace between the evil and the good in the world by spreading more good. And that's what Hanukkah is all about. It's all about lighting up the world and bringing peace into the world. And we know that candles have to do with peace. When we light Shabbos candles, it also has to do with peace. That's bringing peace in the home. But Hanukkah, we said we light by the door. We light by the window, symbolic of outside of the house, as we said before, similar to the candles of the Holy Temple, right? That was more inside the Holy Temple. But Hanukkah is specifically by the window, by the door, outside, because Hanukkah is all about lighting up the outside, the world around you, other people around you. That's what Hanukkah is about. So we get the power, the energy to light up the world on Hanukkah. And we try to take this energy with us to the rest of the year to light up the world, one candle, one little bit of light at a time. Any questions? Excellent. And I love your menorah shirt. Is Thank that a you. Dress? Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was cute. So <laughs> I decided to wear it in honor of Hanukkah. Please send my love to the children. I, I will. miss you tomorrow. Yes, we're really going to miss you. But Have hopefully, a good time. when are you coming back? On uh, New Year's Day, I'll be back. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So we'll be in touch when you come back. And we'd love thank to have you, you for this Shabbos. This is so wonderful. I, I just, thank you so much. My pleasure.